Well, I started Burning Man uh, in 1986 on a beach in San Francisco, and it, and it, and it grew up there uh, until the authorities told us to leave. And uh, uh, so we relocated to uh, the Black Rock Desert, and hence founded Black Rock City, where the uh, Burning Man now occurs, and, and it's been happening for 25 years out there. Well, we begin with nothing, and out of nothing comes everything. And uh, I had the, the philosophical center of Burning Man, and our motto is a phrase uh, by the American philosopher William James, who said, belief is thought at rest. And, and if you don't make room for the unknown in your world, you'll probably end up by trapping yourself and cutting yourself off from the world. So we that's very much what Burning Man is about, is, is, is when you work and labor with others, you drop your emotional armor. And so everyone becomes, shares the same blood somehow. It's like family. Uh, and when you play, then you can express things that conventions wouldn't allow you to do and exceed boundaries in play. You take those two experiences together and make them intense and, and make it practical. And uh, you put that together and, and then what you have is, a, is something that scaling up to 70,000, 100,000 people can all, all do together. Jerry James and um, I've been a builder all my life and uh, in 1986 Larry Harvey and I built the first Burning Man. Um, I well I'm still building no longer building professionally now I'm building the temple for free. Well, when Larry and I started the project, and we didn't even think of it as a project really at the time, you know, this is a very spontaneous thing that we built very quickly. We hardly had any tools with us. And then a year passed and we said, well, let's do it again. And by the third time we made this much larger model and it became a public, public event. A lot of people showed up, people we didn't know. Um, some media showed up, the police showed up. <laughs> uh, As we finally succeeded in pulling this thing up and making it stand, um, that was a really powerful, transcendent moment. And at that time, we were inseparable friends, very close. The project progressed and time passed. You know, um, we just had complications. At that time in 1990, I, I withdrew from my role as the primary builder of Burning Man. So he and I were estranged. Uh, we hadn't actually spoken in uh, 12 years. Uh, I figured we were going to end up 
running into each other because I was getting involved in this pretty conspicuous project. So I w decided to go ahead and call him and, and see if we could work towards some reconciliation of, of some of our differences. And uh, we had a really um, pleasant uh, talk for about half an hour. And unfortunately, two days later, I got the call that he had suffered his stroke. And so we, we ran out of time. Our ideal is to create art, which is a traditional art, always has been, uh, just embodies a way of life. And we wouldn't ask anyone to believe anything, but we'd provide them with experience, and then they'd have to work to construe that as meaning, their own meaning in their own lives. And I think we'd fit in. Uh, it invokes immediate experience. It, it creates a sense that everybody belongs to it, everybody belongs to one another, and everybody belongs to themselves. And isn't that what culture is supposed to do? It used to be that that's what culture did. It taught you how to belong to yourself, how to belong to others, how to belong to the world. And, and if you have that, people, watch people who feel that, just watch how they move. that this city, which is called a playa, with Spanish for beach, and uh, I think that in relation to our future in the world, it's like that original beach, and it's gonna grow again. So it's not just a party in the desert, really. It's more than that. Larry Harvey died this year, so that put a challenge to the community because he was kind of the vision behind the event. And so he was, uh, he was kind of the, he was what we thought was the driving force. And I think the challenge is gonna be seeing the community survive without him at the helm of the ship. Larry, he understood that the culture, of course, was, was bigger than him, and if it is going to be able to thrive, it has to be far more than, than one person, and in fact, it's, you know, here in this in Black Rock City, it's, it's 70,000 people, and their stories and their experiences are every bit as vital and important to the future as Larry Harvey. So, on the one hand, it is a, it is a deep and affecting loss, and on the other hand, the culture has already reached a point in which it is far bigger than, than any one person. going to be bittersweet because I guess the project has been around so long and because of his passing and so on. Uh, now more than ever I meet people who tell me this changed their lives and they thank me and they, you know, for helping to create the event. So I guess you would have to say it ha he has changed the world.
as you notice, there's very little nudity out here. There's very little drugs, but that seems to be what most of the people have thought for so many years what Burning Man is. Uh, and I think, I think it's changing. I think, you know, like the work that you've done with the camera in, in saying, hey, look, it's not about that. It's about a creative community. I think we're, we're trying to educate ourselves and the public about what's going on. We'll find out in the next couple of years, you know, when you ask the, the direction of this event. And we think that culture can be created that is sustainable and, and that creates the, uh, not only identity in a collective sense, but at the same time allows people to be uniquely who they are and what they are and do both at the same time. But that's all we've ever done with Black Rock City. It's an experiment. It's, a, it's like a Petri dish and, uh, in which we do experiments to see, you know, what, what, what sustains humanity, what creates culture, and, and, and is it transmissible, and will it self-replicate? That is, is it alive? Because that's what life does. Black Rock City is a city built by and for its citizens. As an organization, we get a permit every year, we put up a trash fence, we build a man, but the contributions and the fabric of the city get decided by the participants, by the people who build it up. They turn into citizens by the way they engage with their creations. Anybody can come out here if they figure out the logistics and build something for other people to experience. But I think you become a citizen of Black Rock City when you find the answer to the question, why are you doing it? And more often than not, people are doing it because they're looking for connection, because they're looking for a new experience. They're looking for a way to express themselves. 
once you find that, you start to become a citizen of this place and get invested on a personal and spiritual level. My name is John Curley. This is my 13th year. For those years, I come out to the desert when there's nothing here, and they put the spike in the ground where the man will be built, and I watch the city forming around it. As I say, with the golden spike, um, and that is simply, it's a railroad spike that they put to mark the place where the man is going to be built eventually. Then there's a team of surveyors who go out and measure where the radial streets are going to go and they lay out the city grid. After that, a large group of people comes out to the playa and they construct the trash fence that goes to nine mile perimeter around the city. And then the various teams begin their work. So that's how it starts, when there is simply nothing here where this place looks like it has looked for. And the timelessness and the beauty of it, I think, is a big draw for people, as well as the event itself. Black Rock City is a very unique environment where we don't really program that much content into it. What we do is we build a blank city. We put in the streets, we put in the places for people to camp, we make the open area for the art to go, and then we just let people tell us what they would like to do. And un unlike a regular art gallery where you have to come and show that you have a portfolio and people curate it and decide whether you can or cannot show in the gallery, we'll let anybody show within the realms of reason, safety, and sensibility. If it's at all doable, we'll allow people to do that. And we're not trying to judge them or, or, or decide whether that is a good art or bad art or whatever. It's all for them to do it. And I think giving people the permission to do the art here is what's really been life-changing for a lot of folks out in the playa. This blank city offers the chance for people to redefine themselves, to be the people that they believe they are, without anybody questioning if they had experience being that person that they believe they are. And from that point on, they can go on and be that person that they believe they are. I came to Burning Man the first time in 2004. I worked in the power industry in Nevada for 42 years. I'm now retired. So I take more time with Burning Man, make it a hobby instead of a part-time job. I started out as a placement team delivering their ice and also 
put cones up to try to keep the driving traffic down. And then after that, I started helping the placement team and actually assisting the placers with DPW and the power. We build a map of the city, then we flag that map in, flagging out each area for a theme camp, depending on size and interactivity, number of participants, and then we get them all in place, and we just drive around and make sure things are okay. Zero, zero. There, sometimes there are border disputes, somebody may have built their camp over a line, they have a little bit of stress, so we try to stop that for them during the event. We're thinking about how we put the city together. We put certain camps in certain areas so they're easily recognizable. They, they're destination camps inside the city. And inside that, then we build neighborhoods so that you can interact with people that may be thinking the same way you are or someone that is doing something different that is more interesting. So we start, we start with the community of the theme camp, right? Most theme camps, let's just say, an average starts with 20 people and it, it can go all the way up to 400 people and that's the community. Now we take that, those single communities, put them in a neighborhood and make them a bigger community. And then we put those neighborhoods next to other neighborhoods around the city and then all of a sudden we just have this wonderful city. We have 1,570 camps this year. It's the most camps we've ever placed. People every year make it nicer, mm -hmm. right? They have more money or they have the technology gets better, mm -hmm. the lighting gets a lot better. You know, a lot of people think Burning Man is the art because yeah. you see all the pictures and yeah. it's beautiful, but the camps are so much yeah. of the city and all the artists live here, you know? They yeah. live here and they build also camps. Yeah. For the camps to know to be able to build this here you need people to help them figure out how to yeah. organize it so so yeah it's uh i mean our team is placement but we're we're basically urban planning mm -hmm. um and city planning for black rock city so we have a, a team of volunteers it's about 17 volunteers. Our team is structured so that they're reviewing questionnaires that camps uh, submit. They basically get to design how they want the streets to look, uh, where they think important landmarks should be, and so they're really thinking about how to stitch that all together. We don't tell camps like you need to serve coffee or you need to put on this class on this topic. What we try to do is create a framework for people to be able to build whatever they want to build and do whatever they want to do, as long as people can uh, openly participate. But, you know, people don't automatically know that, that how, what camps are about. It's not just where you sleep. It's not just where your friends hang out. And then I think another challenge once we get to apply is having sometimes hard conversations with people, you know. We actually have people that have gone to Burning Man for decades and feel entitled to space or getting a specific spot in the city. And that's not how it works. Just because you've been coming here for 20 years doesn't mean you get to get your number one choice of spot because maybe you're not doing anything. And there's a brand new Burning Man camp that is doing something really great. So I think to the best of our ability, we want to help challenge that and help people realize that this entire city is ours, that every block we should take care of. And also like things change and maybe you won't be at the same address every year.
think there are a couple differences between Black Rock City and a normal city. One is the temporary nature of what we do. Black Rock City, its experimental, short-term nature has uh, a lot of built-in benefits for us to really live out the fullest expression of this culture in this jam-packed you know, period of time. Another thing that's unique about our city is this interplay between groups and the need for resources from, quote, the city, really the Burning Man organization, and therefore we have the ability to have some criteria around it. There are criteria in regular cities, but here we can have simpler things like you need to be interactive, you need to be publicly available, you need to have you know, inviting, visually stimulating frontage, you need to be neighborly, you need to make sure that you're safe, you need to leave no trace when you're here. People think that Burning Man is like all oh, this magic that just pops up. But you know, we keep it very orderly. We have a lot of rules, we have a lot of forms. And uh, Burning Man itself is an experiment, but the city itself is also an experiment. You know, they always say that the biggest form of art at Burning Man is the city. And so, yeah, there's a lot of similarities to many cities, but I think uh, the strongest difference to me is just that you can start over and you can try something out next year. The crucial elements of the city to me are the people. You know, we build a city plan that to me is all around the arrangement and best possible flow of humans. Burning Man is this incredible microcosm to macrocosm of communities. Camps can be anywhere from six people to 400 people. Some are really international, their people are all over the place and they come with some shared purpose, shared goal, shared creative expression, and they make that accessible and publicly available to all of us, which is such a gift. Burners Without Borders is a community activation platform for citizen-led initiatives. And so we're here to empower everyday citizens to look around their own communities and to create projects about impact. So over the last 14 years, we have been involved in projects all around the world. We're a network of over 41 chapters and working groups. And then each year we have about 30 grantees and then several sponsor programs. And so as Burners Without Borders, it's our job to bring our stakeholders together in conversations so that we can be sharing best practices and learnings. You know, I, I would say too that I think the principle of human-centered design is very principal in all of the work that we do all around the world. We never want to go into a community and say we have the solution. We want to go into a community, sit down, have a conversation, and create a solution together. I've been going to Burning Man now for 13 years, which is short for some, but long for others. And I always ask myself this question, why do I continue to go back to Burning Man? And I feel like I have this experience every year where I go out into the deep playa and I see the city out there in the mist. And I have this utter realization of the massive amount of time and love and labor and sweat and tears and resources it takes to create this place, Black Rock City. And I'm so overwhelmed with that amount of potential energy that's latent there. And so that's why I keep coming back to Burning Man, at least for me now, is that I'm inspired in trying to bring together the best makers, thinkers, and doers of Burning Man into conversations that matter and to see if we can catalyze this energy that's in Black Rock City to really make that global impact that we all want and aren't quite sure 
how it's going to happen. I've always brought my kids. I've never been to Burning Man without my kids. Uh, I think it's a, a beautiful opportunity for them to expand their ideas of creativity and interactiveness. Like One of the things that I think is so amazing about being here is the art and how we can interact with it. It's not something that's on a pedestal or behind glass, and the pieces that are here are absolutely stunning. I started coming to Burning Man in 2000, and um, I've always camped in Kidsville. And back then it was kids camp, just a few families getting together as a place to support each other. And it's just continued to grow and grow and grow. Now it's a big village filled with its own theme camp and so many different things in it. When I first started coming to uh, Burning Man, and camping in Kidsville, I felt really held because it was so much work just to bring the kids and take care of them. And, you know, we did creative things with bikes and our campsite and things like that. Having been held that way for so many years, then I wanted to give back and, and, and hold these families. There's a few things uh, for children. I mean, it, some people are surprised that there are children here, but there have been children as part of Burning Man since the beginning. So this area we're in is Kidsville, which is kind of more child-oriented. But there are a lot of events. A lot of the adults like to share their art and their art cars. Um, there's groups that will take the children out on the art cars so they don't have to walk because it's hot. You know, and they go all over and see all the art. And so for a child, there's a lot of things to do. There are areas of the city that are very adult, but you, know, you don't take your children there. It's like any city, and it's easy as a parent to know where to take your children. We are not a festival. A festival has two sides, production and spectatorship or the experience. And the experience has been crafted for the person who is there to consume that experience. But we are different, we are something different. We call it an event, but ultimately it's a manifestation of culture. There's something really special about the culture here in Black Rock City and also about the people that want to take the time to come to a place that feels like the surface of the moon that's really harsh, it's really difficult, that's emotional, that's stressful, that's loud, that's chaotic and make something beautiful out of it. What we always try to do is not create burner culture where it doesn't exist. Our role and how we really view our utility is to be poised to respond to people's excitement in a given place. There's a lot of excitement to be found here in Black Rock City, but it's not just about making the thing itself. It's really about the process and the things that you have to learn in order to make something work out here in the desert. We're really creating an environment for people to engage with one another. So you could be an older new burner and you could be in a nice camp and still show up 
in a really engaging way. I think the conflict is in allowing our habits in the outside world to stay with us when we come to Burning Man. One of the biggest issues that we face right now in our culture is around decommodification. Um, we've seen a big increase in the number of people who come to the event and shoot video for their social media platforms in a way that is used to generate advertising revenue or to promote products or brands. But this isn't the event or the place to do that. The reason is that you're using Burning Man and Black Rock City as a backdrop for a business. We are a city and a culture that operate on the 10 principles, one of which is decommodification. Every time somebody tags an artist or tags a brand that leads you to a commercial site, you're chipping away at some of the culture that people have spent years building. This is a place to take a break from that for a week and hopefully extend out into the world for the rest of the year. The primary concern from the kind of the community unrest side has been around plug and play, turnkey, or convenience camping is kind of the language we're landing on right now. We did say that conveniences should be in service of what the camp is giving to the public. If those things are in place and the conveniences are serving, you know, the public, serving the greater whole, then I think that can be okay too but it's a big but. It's really gotta be done right. Culture really is the collective actions and choices and values and behaviors of all the people who make up that community. Burning Man culture has evolved to be so much more than just the event in Nevada. There are 90 regional events around the world, over 280 regional contacts, there are groups popping up, artist group, maker spaces. What it means to be a burner now is not what it meant 10 or 15 years ago. It's a culture guided by the 10 principles. It's a thing that you know when you see. A lot of our work life now is around making money and contributing to a prefixed idea of what your life is supposed to be. When people say something feels like Burning Man, they're usually talking about experiences with people in community that are not for a specific corporate or financially driven reason. There are the 10 principles that Burning Man Project published, I don't know how many years ago. And that initially troubled me because I'm not, I'm not a member of a religion, I'm not a member of a cult. But those principles were describing what it was that happened here. They weren't meant as directives of what should happen here. It was, hey, this thing is happening. How can, we, how can we get a handle on what the characteristics of the city are? And so, decommodification, you can't buy anything. Gifting, you give things away. Radical self-expression, be yourself. For good or for ill, try new things on that work or don't work. So it goes down that line. So there are philosophical underpinnings for what makes a good burner, I guess. But I don't feel constrained by it. I don't feel directed by it. I don't want to sound like, you know, oh, join the cult and you too, it'll happen to you. It's not like that, you know. Uh, but there's something happening that's, that's encouraging to people, that makes people want to try things and want to, want to express themselves and want to make art and want to behold beauty and want to participate in that process.
I think there are many kinds of citizens in Black Rock City, but I think we can go back to the 10 principles to nail down a couple things that are important. Uh, one is definitely the civic responsibility. And then I think the other thing I would talk about is participation. When you see something awesome going on, do you just walk by or do you allow yourself to lean into it? On top of that layer, we can contribute. Uh, we can look around this place and also other manifestations of Burning Man culture and say, oh wow, you know, people all brought this. Someone took their time to create this, to organize the people, to make it happen, and anyone can do that. That's what's really powerful is that you can transform yourself by participating, by showing up, by just doing the thing that you don't expect yourself to even do. Questions about Radio Protocol? Real life interactions with them. You can call Plasma Cat, Plasma Cat. You can call Kathy Jack, Kathy The Fire Art Safety Team is composed of pyrotechnicians who work in the industry doing firework displays, people who have a background in fuels like LP gas and gasoline, people who are experienced firefighters who understand how to make sure that fires don't get out of control or that they could be put out, various trade professionals. There's about 35 to 37 folks on the team. Most people are doing this because they really want to come out here and have this experience and help others to create their art. We're very much about enabling people to do the dream. We're not really that concerned what people's dreams and wishes are, but we're gonna help you achieve your dream. We're like the behind the scenes stage crew. We're concerned, how do we do the play safely? Well, we had 18 burns this year. A lot of work goes on before the scenes, right? When artists are filling out their um, form online, if they say fire, boop, another form opens up and they decide if it's gonna be flame effects or open fire or pyro or you know a variety of things. And some of them, they don't even know how to execute. So we try to help them do that. So this starts pre-playa, look around April. So we start communicating with them, we have burn meetings with them, and sometimes we can tell if they're not equipped to do what they want to do. And we don't necessarily say no to them, but we'll, we'll talk to them about possibilities. If you're bringing a project to Burning Man, it's huge, right? If you're gonna burn that project at Burning Man, you just added another project to that. So you're doing two projects. And then you have to do Leave No Trace. Like we explained to them that there's so much that is on their plate, they could burn out. So some projects actually, after some of our meetings, they're like, we're not ready. You know, and they'll, so they'll, they'll take a year and they'll do a smaller project and then they'll come back. Yeah, that's a very important question. You're asking, how do we organize the burns that happen? In a burn, there's a lot of stakeholders in the situation. There's the fire department, there's the medical folks, there's the rangers who are keeping the perimeter, there's the law enforcement who are here on the site. There are all these moving pieces. So when we create that command center out there for the burn, we have one person from each of the responsible agencies here. So when we have to make a decision, are we gonna light it? Who's putting on the fuel at one time? Should we release the perimeter? We could do it in a group very quickly and efficiently. When we arrive one hour before a burn, the perimeter needs to be, should have already been set and solid by the artist and their team. We have all the volunteers checking in at 3.05. We have the burn team checking in at nine o'clock. Fast will come to the nine o'clock because that's, we consider it like an incident command place. And they're gonna check in with the artist. They're gonna check in with weather, then just do situational awareness, see if you know the perimeter has been set. Once that's good, then we can start to talk about what's going on. Has anything changed in what you told us pre-event? Let's all get on the same page and then we're gonna call it. This at all times must be clear, right? Because in case an emergency vehicle needs to come through, the emergency vehicle can go all the way through. So that's what we're doing. Matisse, would you explain the wind sock to the film crew? Everybody, this is Matisse. So the wind sock, the wind sock simultaneously shows us the direction and the speed of the wind, right? If the wind sock is straight out, 
it is, the wind speed is at 10 or 12 miles an hour or more. If it's at 50 miles an hour, it's still straight out. Right? At 100 miles an hour, it's gone. Uh, if the windsock is gone, run for your life. If it is straight out, it is... We have these handheld wind meters, which you see Patty holding, which are very accurate, and they'll give you like a five second average and things, but you need to point it exactly into the wind, which is hard to judge. The windsock does that for you. With the handheld thing, you're the only one who can see it. You may need a flashlight on it. You have to take it out and turn it on. And is it on five second average or instant read or whatever? This, everybody on this side can see, well, the reason why we're waiting is because the wind is too fast, right? What we're doing right now is we're setting out the perimeter. And the purpose of the perimeter is for the safety of the art and for the safety of the people that come out to the, to the burn. We want everybody to be as safe as we possibly can. So depending on how big the burn structure is, this is a fairly small structure. It only has a 75 foot parameter. When the man burns, it's gonna have a 300 foot structure because it's a much bigger art piece. And so what our job is, is to make sure that the perimeter is safe. As you saw maybe a little bit ago, when the bike started to come through, we went stop, 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 stop the bike, keep them out of the perimeter. It's a safety thing. People, the culture understands that there's gonna be burns. People will follow burns every night. Once you inform somebody, hey, there's a burn perimeter, go left, and they're like, thanks, and you're like, appreciate it. You know, like, that's the great thing about our culture, is people are thankful, and like, they just want that little bit of information, and they're on their way. So the people who are standing in the line, they're not being mean to the other participants. They're actually creating a space where that participant can enjoy that experience and enjoy what's behind, you know, behind the person who's actually standing the line. Firefighters are going to go downwind and watch for embers. This is precious with the Emergency Services Division. Uh, to do this, he is fully suited in the latest protection gear and one of the most valuable assets on the playa. Yeah, so obviously we take fire safety very seriously at Burning Man. The first word of Burning Man is burning. And in our world, uh, we're here to protect life and property, even though these are art pieces. And this art piece right now is a static piece that's been in public display since it was opened. And then, but we're also part of an art team, so as soon as we light this on fire, it's a new piece every second. As the fire consumes it, it changes it. It smells different. It looks different. There are different colors. The structure is going to operate in a very different way. So we're about to witness the final stages of this artist's uh, idea and dream. Incident Command Center here, and we've got one person from each of the departments, the Ranger, the Fire Service, the Burn Perimeter Support Group, and the artist team, and then myself. And when we need to make a decision, we have the stakeholders in that place who can then work on a decision and then radio out to their prospective groups on what's actually going on here or gather information that we may need. When it comes time to drop the perimeter, we'll all consult again make sure everybody's okay in their different departments and when we all agree on a decision 
then we can release the perimeter. When you go to Disneyland, let's say, or, or a theme park, you don't experience any kind of risk. But when you go to Burning Man, there's so much that's challenging. The camp right next to you has been playing barking dog noises for five days straight at top volume, and it's just about to break you entirely. The danger of the art out on the playa, just getting on an art car, you could fall right off the art car, and you've been baked in the sun. There's so many things that push you to your limit, and then when you come home from Burning Man, you think, oh my God, I'm so much stronger. I never realized that I could do this thing. I came to Burning Man for the art, I stayed for the fire. I like to facilitate the dreams of others. And if this is a small way that I can help build the architecture for the artists to then do their magic, and if I can help somebody if I get to watch the joy in their eyes and their team, you're just like, that was a small part of that. And, and I love doing that. You know, I'm sure there's people that are out here just for the party, but I also think there's a lot more people, many, many more people are out here because they want to build this, they believe in this, and they wanted to see it last a really long time. One of the major points of doing this, there is output that remains after Black Rock City is gone, that the process of taking away the distractions and connections and the laughter and storytelling, if you generate it, it will lift you up and give you a sense of connectivity and hope and peace and generosity that remains so that people find themselves wanting to do Burning Man or they want to create creativity elsewhere. They want to find others and, and create projects and groups. You know, nothing's impossible here at Burning Man. Anything is possible. And so people take that spirit of nothing's impossible back to their hometown, where maybe they've been beat down for years and, and think nothing is possible in my hometown. But they come here and they realize, well, anything is possible, actually and I'm gonna go back home and do that thing. And I think that's part of what Burning Man's goal is, or that's what Black Rock City's goal is, is to shake people up and do a transformational experience. And once people are transformed, they're gonna go out and do all sorts of things, because they're gonna be inspired to make a difference in the world how they wanna make it happen. And I think that's one of the great things about Black Rock City is we don't tell you what sort of a change you're gonna make, we don't tell you what sort of a thing you might get involved with. We're just here to be a platform for when you have that dream, to create that dream within.